This is Social Science Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. Social Science Bites is a series of interviews with leading social scientists made in association with SAGE. There are many theories about crime, its causes and treatment. So how do we decide which ones are effective? Take the case of restorative justice, when criminals and their victims meet face to face. Some critics argue that this approach is too soft on perpetrators and doesn't work. But is this true? Lawrence Sherman of Cambridge University believes that theories about crime can and should be put to the test. He's a passionate advocate of experimental criminology. Lawrence Sherman, welcome to Social Science Bites. Thank you. The topic we're going to talk about today is criminology. I guess we better start with a definition of what criminology is. Criminology is the science of lawmaking, lawbreaking and law enforcing. And the starting point for my own preference, which is to have criminology become the science of making better decisions about how to make laws and how to respond to lawbreaking or to prevent it in the first place. And you're a pioneer in something called experimental criminology, a branch of criminology. Tell us what experimental criminology is. Experimental criminology is a field that is defined by a method, much like experimental physics or experimental biology. The method, of course, embraces a wide range of questions, but in the case of criminology, it's a bit more profound in its implications because for most of its history, criminology has been essentially a descriptive or observational science, sort of like astronomy. We don't think that we can intervene in the way the planets revolve around the sun. The big dispute was whether or not they did. So there's all these very important descriptive questions in any science. But in medicine, the descriptive questions translated very quickly into prescriptive questions of how you treat patients who are sick, how you prevent people from getting sick in the first place. And by developing a field of experimental criminology, what we accept is that the core concerns of a discipline of criminology have to be how societies make decisions and what decisions they should make to deal with their crime problems. So that goes well beyond the descriptive and the observational, the purely theoretical. It requires having very hard empirical evidence, especially randomized controlled trials, which is the primary method in experimental criminology. Fifteen years ago, I founded the Academy of Experimental Criminology. Now we have a Journal of Experimental Criminology. We have a division in the American Society of Criminology. We even have an application group called the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, designed to promote the conduct of experiments in policing, the use of the results of those experiments in structuring police practices, improving police methods. You could have a Society for Evidence-Based Corrections, Evidence-Based Prosecution. Prosecutors are about the most reluctant group to get involved in experimental research. They, more than any other part of the criminal justice system, tend to think they have all the answers. Evidence-based sentencing is very big. There's a lot of interest on the part of judges now who say that it's unethical for them to be sentencing people without knowing the consequences of their sentencing decisions. And this is all coming together in the 21st century to reframe the environment of criminology, to expect criminology to provide the same kind of interventionist guidance that medicine provides, as opposed to biology, as opposed to chemistry. We are an interventionist science and not just observational. So you say you're interventionist and not just observational, but are you dragging the rest of criminology with you? Or would you say most criminologists still practice in the old descriptive style? Yes, most criminologists alive today would have been heavily influenced by the role of social science in the latter 20th century as a source of social criticism, as a source of values that were contrary to conventional values at the time, greater tolerance for diverse lifestyles, greater human rights, lots of good things that social science was associated with. If you consider a book like The American Dilemma by Gunnar Myrdal, which helped us to come to grips with the fundamental immorality of the segregationist laws in the United States, which were being challenged in the 1960s, when police research first became visible and my PhD supervisor Albert Reese did systematic observation of things like police arresting black people more than white people, using police brutality more against black people. And that's really what drew me into the field, the fact that his 
research was observationally and descriptively documenting all of this helped us to accept that there were problems and that we had to do something about it. But in my own career development, I was very fortunate in having the guidance of an observationalist scientist to help me become an experimentalist. My teacher never did an experiment in his career, but he very much encouraged me and gave me good advice about how to do experiments, in part because I had the chance to do it since I had spent some time as a research analyst in the New York City Police Department before I got my PhD. That cocktail, that mix of practical experience with social science at a very high level has been the basis for me pursuing and promoting this agenda of interventionist criminology, and that means experimental criminology. So give me a couple of examples of experiments you've carried out. In 1981, my former supervisor in the New York City Police Department had become the chief of police in Minneapolis, and at my request, he obtained unanimous approval from the Minneapolis City Council to randomly assign arrest. It was the first clinical trial in the world, randomized controlled trial in the use of arrest for any offense. It was in the context of police not having made arrests for misdemeanor domestic violence, common assault, and a new law that gave them the power to do it even if they hadn't witnessed the offense in Minnesota. We got the city council's approval to enlist 40 police officers to act as doctors would in a randomized controlled trial, randomly assigning their patients to different treatments. Now, there's some criticism in criminology of, of calling an arrest a treatment. It's a sanction. It's, it's a step in the process of prosecution. But from the standpoint of the individual who gets arrested, it can be an intervention that changes their life for the better or for the worse. So in this trial, some people were arrested after allegations of domestic violence, and others were merely warned at the scene of the crime. And there was a random approach to who got what treatment, and then you looked at the effect of that. We did, and the initial effect...